necessarily your traditional lecture. I am a deaf professor, a hip hop professor, so there's going to be multimedia and it's going to be dialogic. That means there's going to be, as we learned about Professor Adele's class today, call and response, and we're going to co-construct some meaning. So I'm going to ask you to be a little bit participatory in our talk today, and that at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you a question. And that question is, is hip hop, and it's a problematic question, so as we like to ask in the social sciences, in the social sciences, the question I'm going to ask you all is, and we're gonna, we'll take a vote, is, is hip hop a social movement? Is it a transnational social movement? Is it some sort of movement, some sort of um, political operation going on, or is it just a moment? So at the end, we're gonna vote. Is it a moment or a movement? You dig? Are we cool? You got it? All right. So I like to begin again by taking talking about what we talked, what Jasmine just uh, showed us, and then also pointing up to this introductory <coughs> slide right here, where there is a picture from the 2006 National Hip Hop Political Convention. How many have heard of that? The National Hip Hop Political Convention. Okay, so we'll go into that a little bit later, but um, basically, and how many have heard of the 1972 National Black Convention that have, took place in Gary, Indiana. It was covered in Eyes and Prize. Happened very close to here, sort of. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, 20 years after the 1972 National Black Political Convention, one of the son of uh, activists uh, that worked with the convention, Amiri Baraka or Leroy Jones, um, son, his name is Raz Baraka. Uh, happened to be at the Hip Hop Archive at Harvard University for a community a hip hop community activism and education panel uh, that we were a round table that we were having. And Raz Baraka was on a panel with um, Bakari Kitwana and um, Michael Dawson, sociologist Michael Dawson. And they were discussing the national hip, the National Black Political Convention and question why is there not a national hip hop political convention? And so through that conversation we, some of the people that were present in that room began to organize local organizing committees, and we began to mobilize to have the first National Hip Hop Political Convention in 2004 in Newark, New Jersey. At that point in time, delegates were sent from all over the United States, and there were some international observers, because this is after the time of the election had been stolen, so we're really into allies and international observers. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. That was after the um, 2000 situation that happened with uh, Bush and Kerry. Um, did I get that right? Yeah, okay. So, um, that, so at the end of the 2004 convening, a uh, national hip-hop political agenda was decided upon. And there were some issues, some items were left off, but there was a five, at least a five-point plan that emerged from that convening. We reconvened in 2006 to discuss the three missing items, which happened to be media justice, gender equality, and sexuality equality. Um, and uh, in 2006, and that's what this poster is from, and these are uh, organizers that helped to organize that uh, national convening that took place in Chicago. And they met again um, last summer, in two th summer before last, in 2008 in Las Vegas. This vision of hip hop, these women with their fists up, women who organized, one of them on the, the one with the glasses is Dr. Stephanie Spaulding. She's a professor of English at Clapham University in South Carolina. This, this image is not what we often uh, receive in the, what we call the public sphere of popular media in regard to hip hop. But correct me if I'm wrong, is it? Is this the predominant image? Most people are shaking their heads. Often hip hop, it, we, 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 the messages that we get about hip hop in popular culture, news media, and so forth, even children's programming, is something that might petition something that is considered pathological or stigmatized, i.e. women scantily clad in videos, um, males participating in conspicuous consumption, and so on. Am I wrong? Okay. So where is this disconnect happening? Right here we had Jasmine open up that was utilizing a hip-hop theater art or spoken word to make an important intervention in regard to in what, what we call environmental racism, and, um, and a definite human rights violation of a certain populations of people. So she's utilizing some of the popular culture, hopefully to make an intervention in regard to policy, right? A la Van Jones, correct? Maybe, right? 
that's a definite disconnect from the image of Jasmine in a bikini next to a pool with Jay-Z singing, right? Don't comment. <laughs> we had eye contact. Um, on, so where is this disconnect happening and where is this coming from? Well, a friend of mine, cousin Jeff Johnson, who you might have seen on uh, Fox News or CNN and other news channels, um, had a show on BET about five years ago, four years ago, called the Cousin Jeff Chronicles. And he convened a number of scholars and interviewed people on the streets to sort of talk about this issue. So let's take a look at this three minute clip and see what it is that he had to say. You recognize him now? No? Yes. Tell me if you need to pump it up, I'm just allowed this, but... Today we're going to talk about the gap that exists between the hip-hop and civil rights generation. My name is Jeff Johnson, and this is Cousin Jeff Crump. civil rights and then label like the hip hop generation. For some, that creates a division. The gap is respect. We need to get that respect and that family unity back in the community. She asked what's civil rights, what's this? I got some words for Freedom. Civil rights generation, we don't have a civil rights generation. That's the problem. See, the hip hop gap is going to go back. We might not be for everybody. Hip hop isn't saying we want equality, it's saying nothing. For well, somebody, that's what makes hip hop so powerful because it conveys the same ideas that our predecessors, Mecca Evans, Martin King, and Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Be involved in hip hop. If it was positive, we would. All right, that's my point. If it was positive, have y'all heard anything positive? Y'all ain't heard anything positive about that? They're doing it on the TV, man. Why you keep putting it down? My generation marched, protested, uh, went to jail, organized, and we sang. This generation seems to be to be singing and dancing. Why is that? Why, why is everybody blaming that? That's not our fault that we feel displaced from the civil rights movement. We weren't born. Therefore, if we feel the same, the people who were in the movement, it was their responsibility to pass the torch. <laughs> They assassinated the leaders. I'm not speaking about Fred Hampton from Chicago, Black Panther. They, they murdered, you know, and many others. We know how. I mean, they, they were to destroy the, the movement. And as they destroyed that, like I said, there weren't leaders. There weren't leaders out there that could gather the movement back together and refocus. The disconnect is so much bigger than music. It's not about hip hop. Is the, the baby that was born from a bigger situation? Hip hop was a birth from a situation. They had nothing to do with the music. They think about abortion. They think about not being a jerk. As my generation, how often their parents told them about the sixties. As my generation, how often their parents told them that it ain't sweet yet. That we haven't arrived yet. Instead, it's like we can buy joy. We can go from jobs, we can be safe and secure, we can move out the hood every now and then, we go walk around the suburbs. But in the same token, they never told me, yeah, you can go to a white school because of this. James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi. And we need you to say, listen, here goes some pictures, read this book, oh, I got some footage, because you need to know that. First, you need to know how good you have it, and second, you need to know how far you've got left to go. But this was one generation away. Racism and all the Jim Crow, one generation away. Okay, so I utilized the Cousin Jeff Chronicles to sort of introduce us to some operational definition. We spill on a college campus, so as much as I want to keep it <laughs> hip hop, we're into the academic hip hop. So these operational definitions. I, as a social scientist, as well as practitioner and activist, Define hip hop as a culture, not a music, but a culture containing five, containing um, but not in, including but not limited to five fundamental cultural aspects. And you saw those in the film. You saw people dancing or um, uh, engaging in body performance. We saw, we heard beat production, which would be breath beats, body beats, as well as beat production or turntablism, etc. We did we see some lyricism. Um, we will in a minute if we haven't. Um, as well, and as well as the, the discussion, the cipher, the dialogue of the individuals talking about whether hip hop was political or not, right? When Malcolm had been involved in hip hop, was 
there anything in hip hop that was positive? That sort of um, discourse uh, signifies hip hop philosophy, or what KRS One calls the overstanding element of knowledge. I am not a disciple of KRS One, but I'm going to cite his um, <coughs> to offer, provide an operational definition for hip hop. The one that I utilize in my research builds on that and incorporates elements from linguistic and cultural anthropology. So the main thing that we want to think about is the way we're talking about hip hop today is as a culture, okay, and not just music. Why does this matter? Hip hop is part of a popular culture. It's part of an international popular culture. And some people, this is highly debated, we can talk about this in our question and answer time, consider it a black popular culture. Wherever it is that you locate hip hop in the realm of popular cultures, we can learn something from Stuart Hall, who mentioned that popular culture is where we discover and play with our identifications of ourselves. It's where we learn ourselves, right? It's where we learn about ourselves. Where we are imagined, where we are represented, not only to the audiences out there who do not get the message, but to ourselves for the first time. As you all uh, consumed that media that we just played from the Cousin John Chronicles, some of you all might have recognized certain people and had a connection with it and learned something about the way in which we're thinking about this, and others might have missed that message. That is the interesting thing about cult popular culture and the messages and the lessons that we get from it. Popular culture is important for analytical interests and for people that do um, academic studies because it is related to research and this idea of policy. All of these things will mutually influence one another. Research that is done by academics, and it tends to be the basis for policy that is made. Think in terms of our health care reform plans, the economic stimulus bill, if we're going to keep it to a domestic or national example, right? The people who, well, on one level, the people who conducted the research or the conventional aides who read the papers that were done by the people who did the research all might watch Grey's Anatomy on Thursday nights and are learning information about race, gender, culture, sexuality, transnational identity, and so forth, right? So popular culture influences the people who are doing the research. Research might influence the policy or the laws that are made that govern our lives. And the law, the policy might also influence what kind of popular culture we're able to have access to. Or what type of popular culture, um, the policy might, might influence what type of um, popular culture, it might influence what type of popular culture we not only have access to or how we access it, but what it is that we, can, can, we are able to consume for the idea of what Chomsky calls manufacturing consent in regard to ideas, dominant ideas of the day. So to give an example of what hip hop organizing looks like. So we heard people debating whether it's positive or not. How about some examples of what it looks like? Rather than me um, going through some examples, um, I'm right there anyways, um, we're gonna have a one minute um, summary of hip hop organizing within the United States before we travel to Brazil to see what it looks like there. The answer may not be visible in the front pages of local newspapers, but there are those within the hip hop community that have picked up the night. The hip hop political movement just grew at like an exponential rate. There's no movement like this since the civil rights movement right. where folks have become involved in electoral politics to this degree. I was blown away by what the young people are doing because they have taken it upon themselves to learn to use hip hop as an organizing tool. So they'll stand on the street corner and they'll be, you know, spitting spoken word and rapping and they'll use that as a way to draw people in and say, okay, now you need to register to vote. All we try to do is get the people to vote. They got the police is out here trying to go and rush us over cars that say vote. This is a map of the way hip-hop organizing looks in the United States. On the West Coast, the Bay Area has a huge hip-hop political <laughs> Over here in New York City um, and in D.C. are a lot of where the national organizations are. Citizen Change, Hip-Hop Speaks, Vote and Die, and Black Youth Folk Organizes Down I don't know why it's doing this, but... South. The Hip-Hop Pack works out of Chicago. We have the Hip Hop Convention out in New Jersey. So Hip Hop is all over the map. Okay, 
so my apologies for the technical difficulties, but what I was hoping that you all saw from that clip is the hip hop map of the United States, and hopefully, you just trust me if you didn't see it, there were little tacks tacked in everywhere. And there were particular hotbeds like the Bay Area, New York, as well as Chicago, and then there were rural areas where we have a number of hip hop nonprofit organizations and NGOs. So domestically, although it might have been off the radar to Julian Bond and Senator Eleanor Holmes Norton, who talked earlier saying that what's hip hop's political message? Um, and it just seems to them that it's pathological and not politically progressive. We do have evidence of a number of people off the radar outside of pop utilizing this aspect of popular culture for political or progressive change. However, what do hip hop's cultural workers um, say? And to give you an operational definition of cultural worker, um, it, I'm utilizing a similar to where a theorist named Antonio Gramsci talked about organic intellectuals in which um, Gramsci theorized about um, um, intellectuals that were different from, say, traditional or academic intellectuals, that even if they themselves were not organizing, they had deputies to whom in which they entrusted the act of organizing. And so I'm conceptualizing, and, and these two individuals actually self-identify as cultural workers. If you go to Chuck B's MySpace page, he says, as a cultural worker, I work to, to use hip hop to you know, empower people politically or something like that. Um, so Rosa Clemente, does anyone know who Rosa Clemente is off the record? Who is she? Who is she? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Rosa Clemente is, a, is um, an inspiration um, to me, and she was one of the co-founders of the National Hip Hop Political Convention. She was the vice presidential candidate for the Green Party. She ran with Cynthia McKinney in the past election. Uh, she, we, uh, Davey D, last March, asked her, and she thought that hip hop was a, as a movement, and I'll give you a little bit of information about her answer in a minute. Also, he asked Chuck D, do we know who Chuck D is? He was the front man and organizer for a group called Public Enemy. If you ever saw the movie Do the Right Thing, it had Fight the Power in it and so forth. If it's still disconnected, if you've ever heard of a show called Flavor of Love, that main <laughs> character, Flavor of Love, Flavor of Flav, was like the hype man for Public Enemy. Okay, is it relevant enough now? All right. So, to make a long story short, Rosa Clemente did not think that hip hop was a movement. And if you want to see these interviews, you can go to davide.com or go to his YouTube page where he has these interviews. Um, he did this for our class. We co teach a hip hop class at San Francisco State University together. And so this was for our students' midterm. Um, so Rosa Clemente argues that it's not a political movement because we have not effectively presented the governing uh, administration, such as um, local governors, mayors, and our presidential administration, with a political agenda that uh, would urge them to act in favor of our political agenda with the threat of consequences, as certain lobbying parties have successfully done. Chuck D counters that it is a hip hop, it is a social, it is a movement, a social movement, because when he travels around the world, he sees people utilizing it to say something that is politically progressive. Let's take a look at some of the examples of what Chuck D might be talking about. This is Brazil in Time. It was produced by B Plus or Brian Cross and Eric Coleman. And uh, what I'd like you to pay attention to, you have to read the subtitles to hear what they're talking about, but look at the images of Africa and blackness. You'll see Zumbi. Um, you'll see the continent of Africa. You'll see different children from different favelas, and you'll hear people talking about identity and references to black power and pride. And then you Okay, I'm going to have to get hip hop with this now. If it's going to do that, then we are going to watch this. Please pardon my desktop. We are going to watch this. So, um, so do you mind? Is that okay to innovate? All right. Eu, assim, a 
gente mora numa favela, né? Vocês estão morando na favela, as condições são. Não é nem falar que são precários, são precaristas. Você não tem luz elétrica no barraco, você não tem água encanada, você não tem nada, você tem vocês totalmente excluídos, você é um zero à esquerda mesmo. Sem endereço, né? Para mostrar para vocês, até para um serviço tem que ter endereço no, é, do seu vizinho, do seu melhor amigo. E para ouvir os discos, tem que ir na casa dos amigos também. Então, quer dizer, era uma coisa de guerreiro mesmo, sabe? De, de não se entregar ao mesmo sistema. Você não queria que a gente fosse aquele que eles queriam, mas a gente não queria ser o que eles queriam. Convention. 
and so forth. And for um, a list of black social movements, I uh, encourage you to check out Yvonne Bino's text, Stand and Deliver, which um, critiques, assesses the strengths and weaknesses of this idea of hip-hop politics. So let's give another example of how this looks in Tanzania. Yeah. 
which is like a World War II type reference to being a Japanese man. In the same way in which when I was younger, and probably before many of you were born, a group called X-Clan used to assert masculinity and cultural nationalism by saying, you know, I do the great pip struck because I'm a black man. And it's that sort of like rising of power and prowess through an assertion of one's identification. And so Hanya, so the, I, the, what Hanya is doing by declaring that he's um, a Nippon Danji, a Japanese man, is, is, is referencing um, uh, history, nationalist discourse, as well as normative ideas of masculinity to situate himself as the more powerful in C. He also talks about, he also boasts about um, informal economic connections in his community of Shinjuku. Um, Khan came back by saying, I'm also from Shinjuku. And, and just he was able to talk about his informal economic connections in Shinjuku, uh, utilizing what we call phonies or sounds to create um, a flow that people were attracted to that won him the, the title. And so these are the sorts of things that one might ask, well, how is this political? The, 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 one of the things that they were talking about, so one of the um, things that they were talking about was this idea of saving themselves and saving Japan through hip hop. Hip hop as a tool for learning themselves, hip hop as a tool for understanding power, how power works, and saving oneself. And so it's that sort of rhetoric, that's one way in which in the arts, we can, as, as Jasmine demonstrated for us at the very beginning, that we can situate hip hop as a culture that can support progressive political action. Before I close, I would like us to caution against what I would consider like this binary opposition or this binary hip hop and that there's this commercial hip hop and then there's conscious hip hop as if those can't ever be the same. Or there's that positive politically progressive hip hop and then there's that trash can of garbage gangster hip hop or something like that. Have you all heard of those dichotomies before? They get sticky and contradictory because sometimes the conscious rapper might have domestic violence charges. Or sometimes the gangster rapper might be the poster person for parenting and children and family development. And so it's difficult for us to totalize these identities in one particular category or not when there's so much information that occurs in 16 bars, there's so much information that occurs in 30 seconds of a music video. There's so much information that occurs in the way in which beats melt together and we experience through production that sometimes we get contradictory information and by understanding how to weed it out and analyze it might help us to understand why it is that masses of people all over the world are attracted to this for political purpose. Some of the things that I've pulled out in my research is this whole idea, we see this from Wild Style and like early Melly Mel, Grandmaster Flash kind of lyrics, this idea of don't giving up, right? And raising our self-esteem. Like in Wild Style, Melly Mel says, you know, look past the garbage, over the, you know, through the wounds, over the trains, and so forth. And he talks about, like, to some people, living in the Bronx is a challenge, but he sees it as an opportunity to rise above the state debris. That's this idea of don't give up. Believe in yourself and you will transcend. And we might say that this is what Wayne is talking about in a million. Maybe. That's debatable. We can talk about that question and answers. But maybe when people are attracted to, um, you know, Will Wayne saying, you know, I'm tougher than Nigerian hair, however problematic that verse, that utterance may be, he is trying to assert something about self-esteem. And perhaps that is that, that idea of swagger is what people are attracted to. There's also this idea of utilizing African American English or referencing um, things um, throughout African American history or African diaspora or African black social movement idea ideas. And we see this in Rich Boys, there's some D's on it. Y'all have to ask me what I mean by that in question and answering, because I think I need to speak through this. Um, finally, Soldier Boy. There can't be anything positive about Soldier Boy's helmet, right? The Superman song, right? Well, I was, I was at Stanford when I heard about this song. Um, I was underground finishing my dissertation, and my students came back from vacation saying, because they knew I was extremely critical of hip hop's gender and sexuality politics. They were like, have you heard, Dr. Fisher, have you heard the, the Superman song? You know, expecting some sort of reaction from me, and I said, no, no, I haven't, and so then they played it for me, and I was like, oh, that's the most awful, ridiculous, dehumanizing, you know, utterance I've heard, you know, in at least two years. Uh, and so, uh, then I saw this video, which you see a snapshot of here, and I saw kids, what I saw, if I were to close my ears 
and not listen to the utterances from a 17-year-old boy, which to be fair, is probably what 17-year-old boys do think about and write. Um, if I'm gonna be honest as a parent, a mother, um, I've gotta prepare myself for that reality. Um, there, what I found empowering about the images was the idea of this black middle class, or this idea of black people using technology. They're editing videos and posting them using their MacBooks and their MacBook Pros and, and, and checking, being, getting on the internet, using your telephones and so forth. And in a world that it had, the predominant images of black people have been maybe as criminals or violent or something else, that is a very different image to be transnationally transmitted in regard to black identity. So we can debate these ideas, but th this is some idea in which, you know, it's very easy to talk about how a dead press song talking explicitly about raising a revolution is politically progressive. But sometimes it becomes more difficult to argue how Little Wayne can be considered politically progressive. And those are some ideas for how we as analysts, as professional academics, and activists can approach the question. Another thing in regards to that is the idea that conscious rappers are you know, free from critique. While that might be the, the soundtrack to the on-the-ground NGO organizing that we do, we should, we sh as hip-hoppers, it is part of hip-hop to critique the sexism or, or gender or anything dehumanizing that we, that we might encounter, even in that which is considered politically progressive. For example, most death talks about, right, you know, and Umi says, I want black people to be free. It's an empowering, wonderful narrative that raises that self-esteem and tells us not to give up. However, in Miss Fat Booty, um, when we see this video right there, you probably can't see the words, but in the, there's a female, there's an arrow using graffiti, and the word says trouble. And so that is how we can analytically under, um, analyze some of the information that we are consuming and think, okay, I want the only says black people to be free, but I'm going to do without the um, women being trouble image because it's not sustainable for some humans to make it and not others. If we're working, if hip hop is working towards human equality, then we all must come up, right? And the same thing with the dead press. Hell yeah, and again, these are songs, these are artists that I myself consume. However, at the end of, um, I think this is Hell Yeah, and Stick in, oh, wakes up and it's just a dream that you know he was in the United States um, and so forth would happen. Do you, can you see what his what the, what what liberation and revolution looks like for him? And that might be his conception, but that's not my conception. Okay, <laughs> and that is he's being fed. I think he's being fed fruit by a lot of women in scantily clad African fabrics um, on a beach. Um, and so we can go on with Little Brother and Kate Up Shine just to give an example because sometimes uh, scholars will try to act like it's just hip hop in the United States that does these things. But no, I have tons of evidence. Go to the hip hop archive and there's, there's boxes and boxes of sexist and homophobic um, hip hop um, from Japan and other countries as well. Um, one more thing, when we look at hip hop activism, it's important not to, um, it's important to remember people's names and not reproduce omission, sense of omission that we saw in times past. When I watch Eyes on the Prize, um, like documentaries and so forth, I get to know people's names like Andrew, Jesse, Martin. If you don't know who I'm talking about, you really we need, to, we need to take some African American studies classes. But we know who Jesse Jackson is, right? We know who Martin Luther King is and so forth. We get to know these characters and these names. But when we see the background footage, we might see a lot of people at a table, and most of those people might be women, but we don't know their names. And thus is the importance of Rachel Wren's work, who's going to be visiting, you're very lucky to be visiting with her later on this semester. And her famous film, Nobody Knows My Name, touches on this exact idea. So I should probably stop talking about it so she can. But just to give an example, these two pictures, um, one is from the meeting after we founded um, the Bay Area Local Organizing Committee. Some of the international organizers met at, um, in Oakland at a restaurant, had lunch. That's Jeff Chang, Baye Dofo, myself, David D, Chuck D, Reverend Sekou, and Bakari Kitwana. There's only one female in the picture. If we go to, that was in 2003 that this picture was taken. If we go to 2006, and even I myself wasn't as conscious enough to be documenting and recognizing um, doc, uh, how to document things in a way that doesn't reproduce the way social movements have worked in the past. I did have that analysis in 2006, and I took this picture of all these female organizers, um, starting from Dr. Spaulding on the, on, in the, in the, in the uh, turquoise dress on to uh, Lakeisha Graysoul, who's a, a hip-hop journalist and activist out of um, Chicago, just to give an example. 
Does that mean, while we critique hip gender and sexuality and other limitations in hip hop, it's important to note that there are cultural workers doing important work to push boundaries that we do not see in other realms of popular culture. For example, Rennie Harris, both Rennie Harris and Isla De Leon have amazing hip hop theater pieces and, and hip hop dance pieces in which they um, uh, analyze in innovative and unmatched ways ideas of norm normative constructions of masculinity, normative constructions of, fem of, of, of femininity, uh, childhood sexual abuse, gender-based violence, and so on. And we don't see this sort of activism in other forms of popular culture, so it's important to honor it and name it and recognize where hip-hop is pushing the envelope domestically as well as internationally. Um, you can see examples from Jay Smooth's PSAs, uh, which we can look at during question answers if <coughs> someone asks me to play it. And um, but if you look at some of the titles, he looks at you know how to tell people they sound racist, um, an old person's guide to no homo, where he's critiquing homophobia. Um, and he had an interview with Elizabeth uh, Barry Martinez. Elizabeth Martinez Barry. Yes, that's her, uh, Elizabeth, I think it's Elizabeth Martinez Berry, um, after the Chris Brown and Rihanna situation, to not just talk about them, but to talk about activating oneself against gender-based violence in communities. And finally, to end with an example of something that's close to my heart, um, helping our teen, girl, teen girls in real life situations. Uh, this is the website, and this is the executive director, Dr. Carla Stuck, she's the founder. I merely sit on an advisory committee and just check in once in a while and hear how I can support their campaigns because they do amazing work with um, black adolescent girls in the Atlanta area. And uh, so an example of what these um, young women do is PSAs, and you can just go to their website. It's helpingourteengirls.org. And they have um, guides for other girls like themselves to find a testing site, to get education about sexual health, well-being, and other forms of empowerment. It's important to recognize the progressive political growth and action all over the world, including that which takes place in our backyard. So a moment, how many of you are in favor of it being a moment? Raise your hand. Um, and how many of you think it's a movement? Okay. To, 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 to talk about our, the person that said, just, a few, just to let you know, a couple weeks, four weeks ago, I gave a talk at St. Mary's in East Bay, California, and like the young people there were telling me that it's a moment, and I'm delusional, and I need to wake up. <laughs> so just to let you know, it changes in every audience. So it's interesting. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Have a great Monday night.